Okay, so today we are going to wrap up a lot of the content for thermodynamics, right? So the key thing to keep in mind for us in this class is that we are not concerned with deriving the equations or predicting solubilities other than in simple systems, right? Thermo 2, the second semester of thermo, that's what that class is designed to do. Uh, but a lot of these calculations are actually too complex to accurately predict regardless of how much effort you put into it. So a lot of times we'll be talking about solubilities and things like that in terms of experimental measurements. And so on your handout that you should have, uh, we have two charts that we'll go over today. <clears throat> one is a psychometric chart. This one is a compact way to contain humidity calculations. Right? These are relatively easy to calculate. We could do this. This is just really for a matter of convenience. Uh, because the material balances with humidity can be somewhat tedious, considering what's your basis, you have three components, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, the second one here is called the triangle diagram. This is the one we'll use for liquid-liquid equilibrium. Uh, liquid properties are extremely difficult to predict. So having three liquids that are partially miscible and the partitioning of those liquids into two phases, that's an extremely complex calculation, even for you know, a, a very well-trained person in thermodynamics. Uh, so with this here, this is the more common approach used to do liquid-liquid equilibrium calculations, uh, which is just use the experimental data. Uh, but first, I want to do a recap of how we got to this point. So we were talking quite a bit about liquid vapor equilibrium with respect to a flash separator, where we have a feed of a particular total composition, right? we use the Z to denote total <coughs> molar composition. We have a top stream or a vapor stream, which has a vapor composition. And we have a bottom stream or a liquid stream with the mole fractions of the liquid phase. Now the goal for all this section of the class is to essentially remove the arbitrariness of the problems that are assigned, or the problems that you can solve. Right? At the start of the class, we would say, oh, there's a distillation column, and the bottom leaves at this concentration, and the top leaves at this concentration. Right? That is going to be reduced now. So instead of saying what the concentration is, we're going to be calculating what the theoretical maximum is, and then doing a fraction of that theoretical maximum. Right? Thermodynamics is the properties at infinite time. So in order for us to get to thermodynamic conditions on these top and bottom streams, we would have to have an infinitely sized flash separator and the liquid would take an infinite amount of time to go through. So instead, what we're going to be talking about is sort of either idealized calculations or we're going to be getting to some fractional percentage of the idealized conditions. So in this case here for the flash separation, we had a series of equations. So if we, the standard flash, we know the feed conditions, and we know the temperature and pressure. What we don't know is the composition of the liquid, the composition of the vapor, and the total amount of liquid and the total amount of vapor. So for a two-component system, that gives us six unknowns, which are the L, the V, YA, YB, XA, XB, if this is a mixture of A and B. And we need six equations. So the equations that we have are an A balance, a B balance, or a total balance. Now recall, this only gives us two equations, because the total balance is just the A and B balances added together. We have the summation of x's and the summation of y's equal 1. And we have two Routes Law expressions. <coughs> So essentially, this is our flash calculation. Now, we can add on more and more components. For every component we add, we add additional Routes Law expressions. Okay. So we use these equations here, though. right? We use these equations to derive the dew and bubble conditions. Now, in the flash scenario, we have some appreciable quantity of L and some appreciable quantity of V, a total amount of liquid and a total amount of vapor. In the dew and bubble calculations, right, 
we made the assumption that one of these two terms was infinitesimally small. Right? For the bubble point calculation, we're looking at when an all liquid mixture forms its first vapor bubble, in which case it's almost 100% liquid and almost 0% vapor, which means that we know what the X composition is because it's the same as the P composition. Right? That's the simplification we made for the dew and the bubble curves. But the equations that you can derive for the bubble point and the dew point are exactly the same. <clears throat> so for example, for the bubble curve, we said that the total the liquid composition is equal to the uh, uh, total composition that L is approximately equal to the feed. And so in this case, what we did is we put the equation, equation Ya is equal to x a p a star into, routes, into uh, this equation. There's a very brief recap of how we got to this point. We know that it's the bubble point, because that's a particular set of conditions, where the liquid composition is equal to the total composition. We're saying that we have a very small amount of vapor forming, so the total amount of liquid is effectively the same as the total amount of feed. We rearrange Routes' law, substitute it into our consistency relationship, and we derive this expression here for the bubble point. Now, what makes this the bubble point equation is that approximation. But let's say, for example, we forget about that approximation. This equation is still valid, right? All I did is I substituted a few of these six equations into one another. Right? I substituted my two Routes law expressions into one of my consistency relationships. So what makes this the bubble point equation is not how I substituted it. It's this part right here, where I know my x's. But let's say instead I'm doing a flash calculation, a two-component flash calculation. I could continue to approximate this solution here. So far what I've done is I have used Routes law for component B, Routes law for component A, the consistency relationship for the vapor fraction. Let's say I add in the consistency relationship for the liquid fraction. So if I do that, my system pressure is equal to x of A, P A star, plus 1 minus x of A, P B. How many unknowns do I have in this equation for a flash calculation? One. One, which is it? X. X. And that's how I break into a flash calculation. Right? It's just simply substituting those six equations together. But what throws a lot of people off is this. I used the bubble point equation. Right? But notice what I solved for. In this case, I'm saying that I know my x's because they're equal to my total composition, and I'm calculating an unknown pressure. I'm using the exactly same equation, but in this case, I'm saying I know the pressure because of my flash separator design, and I'm solving <coughs> for my unknown composition. And you can do exactly the same thing with the dew curve, just flipping it around the other way, and the equation looks a little bit different. So depending on what information you have, all of these equations for vapor-liquid equilibrium are exactly the same. The only difference is what you're solving for. So in the homework, you can take the bubble point equation, but you're not solving for the bubble pressure. You're solving for the bubble temperature. It's still one equation, one unknown. But in the simple case, if you know the temperature, you can directly calculate the pressure. But in the temperature case, you know the pressure, you have to solve for the temperature that satisfies this expression here. And so in numerical methods, I would rearrange this to be equal to, now let's write this differently, let's make it a little easier.
right? Always solve your equation so that it equals zero. Makes it so much easier on yourself because you can double check your work instantaneously. Look at your equation, is it equal to zero? You solved it. Okay, so this should help us with the homework. And as a recap of why we're doing all of this. Now for vapor liquid equilibrium, we can solve things reasonably well because the vapor phase is something we can readily predict. But a lot of other phases are hard for us to predict. Solid properties, liquid properties, those are all very difficult. So instead, <clears throat> instead of us going through this level of detail for every type of solubility we can encounter, gas and liquids, liquids and liquids, solids and liquids, right? We're gonna have to rely on data and other methods to address these issues. So the term that we would like to really define here is called solubility or saturation. <clears throat> and this corresponds to the maximum or thermodynamic limit. Right, so if we think about this in terms of like salt in water or sugar in water, right, we know that we can only add so much salt or so much sugar to water at room temperature. That would be the solubility limit. So the goal of these flash calculations with Routes Law is to determine the solubility limit of one vapor in another or one liquid into another. Okay? But when it comes to conditions that we can't very easily predict, we're going to be saying this is the solubility limit. This is the maximum amount. And then we're going to say maybe it's half of the solubility limit or 80% of the solubility limit. So the key thing is to know what we mean by solubility or saturation. So in the case of humidity, with this psychometric chart, it doesn't have to be 100% humid, which is fully saturated. It can only be partially saturated let's say 50% relative humidity, 90% relative humidity. What I want you guys to do is to take that exact same concept to go from a saturated or fully saturated solution, oftentimes is what we call it, to a partially saturated. So if I say X grams of salt can dissolve in X grams of water, right? And if I say it's half of the solubility limit, then you know what the composition of one of the outlet flow streams is. Does that make sense? So it's just a term that is really important to recognize, solubility or saturation. Routes law, humidity calculations, those only give us the 100% equilibrium infinite time result. Right? But you don't have to be there. Right? We can be at some fractional limit below the solubility point. Sound good, everyone? Okay. So <clears throat> what I'd like to do uh, before we move on to liquid-liquid equilibrium is I want to talk a little bit about this psychometric chart because it's on your homework uh, and it's an important chart not because you know you're going to be curling up with it every night before you go to bed to read it and study it but because learning how to read a psychometric chart is learning how to read all engineering charts so it's not just about the psychometric chart okay it's about learning how to read all engineering charts the psychometric just happens to be one that's a uh, somewhat useful for the class. All right, so I'm going to try and reproduce it the best I can on the board here. Uh, but you've got one uh, in front of you that you can read. So there are a lot of lines. I have a 2D graph. I need to fix myself in a position on this 2D plane. How many pieces of information do I need to know my position on a 2D plot? Two. two. Does it matter what two pieces of information? No. Any two pieces of information fix you into positions that you can read off everything else. That is the case with every single engineering chart. You need two pieces of information to lock you into a position on this chart and then you read everything else off of it. Okay, so on the bottom axis here, they call it the dry bulb temperature. Dry bulb temperature is the temperature that you and I experience. Okay, and so from this, we have a series of vertical lines. Right, so if we say that this room is 70 degrees Fahrenheit, that is the dry bulb temperature. 
Now this is in contrast to the wet bulb temperature. Now this is a notation that is back in the olden days of engineering. What the wet bulb literally is, is you take a thermometer, you wrap it in a rag, you dip it in some water, and you swing it around over your head. Now what that does is, let's say we swing that around over our heads in Arizona. It'll cool off really quickly, just like a swamp cooler, right? Because all that water is going to evaporate, and when that water evaporates, it steals energy away from the system and it drops the temperature. But let's say I try and do that same procedure in fully humid air. No water is going to evaporate. So you'll notice if you look at your chart, you have additional lines here that curve up. <clears throat> These are lines of relative humidity. As your relative humidity approaches 100, that's when you get to your wet bulb temperature. Relative humidity equals 100%. <clears throat> so the wet bulb temperature can also be viewed as sort of the dew point. If you drop your temperature below, right, if I drop my dew bulb temperature, the temperature in the room, that means I'm marching in this direction. So if I have a point here, right, let's say this is 70% relative humidity. And if I drop my temperature, I'm going to go this way until I hit 100% relative humidity. And then my liquid is going to condense out. Right? So the question is, how do I know that this is the way I should draw my line from dropping the temperature? Well, one, that's a decrease in the dry bulb temperature. And two, on this axis over here, we have the humidity ratio. also known as the absolute humidity. Because this gives us grams of water per gram of dry air. So if I have a closed balloon, right, I'm not adding or subtracting any mass of air. I'm not adding or subtracting any mass of water. So if I'm cooling the temperature of a closed system, I should be keeping a constant humidity ratio. Is this making sense? Mm -hmm. So the wet bulb temperature is the temperature at which it will condense at, or the temperature of 100% humidity. So if you follow, if your dry bulb temperature and your wet bulb temperature are the same, you know you have 100% humidity. But the key thing with the psychometric chart is fixing yourself into two positions. Because there's a lot of other information on here. It's a really crowded chart. If you see, there's some diagonal lines that go this way. Those are for specific volume. That tells you the density of the air. Uh, there's also some additional lines up here. You can see it's 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, 120, 140. That's the enthalpy. That's something you'll use for energy balance calculations. What is the enthalpy of the gas? How much energy does it take to heat something up or cool something down? So, so my psychometric chart is not just, well, this chart is obviously just for air and humidity, but Reading, if you can read a psychometric chart, you can read a lot of other engineering charts. Key thing is to lock yourself into position and then read off all the other properties, right? So if I were to say we are right here, for example, and obviously we can't answer this question explicitly, right, you could tell what the temperature is, what the relative humidity was, what the absolute humidity is, how much water per air there is, all these different things. And the other thing that's really useful about a psychometric chart is that it's all done on a basis of one gram or one kilogram of dry air. So we don't have to worry about the water too much. It's already assumed a basis for us. So typically when you're doing humidity calculations, it's easy to keep the basis of one amount of dry air. Because the water's going to change here and there. But if you keep dry air, it's going to stay relatively easier. Okay. There's also a video on my channel about reading these. So if you need any more specific details, please refer to that. Uh, I believe it is my most viewed YouTube video, so I'm proud of that one. Uh, and there's also another good video on triangle diagrams, which we'll talk about in a second. Yes? What about pressure? Is that so this chart says it's pressure at one atmosphere? Yes, so that would change things. So the higher up you get in elevation, the lower the pressure is. That's going to affect your Ralph's law. 
So recall, this whole chart is developed essentially based on this one equation. Right, this is our equation of Routes law for one condensable component. So if I change my system pressure, going from sea level to where we're at in Utah, the summit of Mount Everest, right, it is going to be changing your mole fraction. Right? And in the homework last week, you converted your mole fraction here into units of effectively the humidity ratio. What is the absolute amount of water in the air under these conditions? I think you guys did that last week, or is that this week? I don't remember which of the two. But this is a calculation that I think you either have done or will do. Right? So yes, obviously changing the system pressure will change the chart itself a little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so... Psychometric chart is something uh, out of convenience. But the next topic, liquid-liquid extraction or liquid-liquid equilibrium. In liquid-liquid equilibrium, <clears throat> we have triangle diagrams and other charts because we cannot easily predict what's going on. So how a liquid-liquid extraction process would go is first let's consider a mixture of benzene, toluene, and xylene. So of course, right, if you look at these molecular structures, we have benzene, which is just one aromatic ring. We have toluene, which is an aromatic ring with a methyl group. And we have xylene, which has a number of different configurations. Uh, I'm just going to draw it in you know, one of these like this. I don't remember if that's ortho, ortho, meta, para, or whatever. Right, xylene's got a number of different structures. So these chemical structures, they all look pretty similar. Right, so we would expect that benzene, toluene, and xylene should all dissolve into one another. And they do. Right, they're effectively infinitely miscible. However, what if we have a mixture like ethanol, water, and benzene? We have ethanol, which is a polar hydrocarbon. We have water, which is extremely polar and not a hydrocarbon. And benzene, which is a nonpolar hydrocarbon. So we really have three different classes of molecules. These are only partially miscible. Whereas miscible means can be mixed. Right? Ethanol and water obviously dissolve into one another, otherwise we wouldn't have alcoholic beverages. Ethanol and benzene, they actually do dissolve into one another relatively well. But water and benzene, well, they really don't like each other, right? Effectively mixing an organic with an inorganic solvent. Now, the trouble is, the ideal gas law doesn't even predict the existence of liquids. We have to get to something like a cubic equation of state to even predict that liquids exist, right? So yes, now we can predict that liquids exist with the van der Waals equation. But the key thing is, can we accurately predict liquid properties? The difficult part is no, we really can't accurately predict liquid properties. For benzene, actually we can pretty well. Right? It's a relatively simple hydrocarbon. So like the Peng Robinson or the SRK, it probably nails the density and properties of benzene decent. Water? Well, there's specialized equations to state for water. Ethanol? Yeah, you can probably get pretty close to predicting the properties of ethanol. But is there one magical equation that can 100% accurately predict the properties of ethanol? while also 100% accurately predicting the properties of water and 100% predicting the properties of benzene and predicting the properties of mixtures of every single composition of these. No. We are not that good. Right? Try as we may to derive an equation that can predict all of these properties perfectly well, we cannot. So instead we say, eh, forget about it, let's just measure it. Right? And how we measure it is in a triangle diagram among other different types. So before we get into reading triangle diagrams, I first want to get into what a liquid-liquid extraction process would look like. 
So in this case, <coughs> we would want to have a unit operation where we would have some sort of settling into two different liquid phases. We would have two feeds and two outlets. So in this scenario here, we would build a liquid-liquid extractor to pull one solute out of two immiscible solvents. Right, so I would say that maybe in this case, uh, ethanol would be, let me get, see if I match it up for the triangle area. Ethanol would be component B, water would be component A, and benzene would be component C. So if you follow along in your triangle diagram, uh, I'm trying to arrange it so it makes sense a little bit. <clears throat> so we can kind of learn about the extraction and the triangle diagram at the same time. So in this scenario, what we would be trying to do is to try and pull our, co our, our solute B from A with C. So in this case, we would be trying to pull ethanol from water. So ethanol from water using benzene. I guess it's a little bit confusing because the B is a C. So how this would work is that I would have a mixture of A and B entering the system with pure C. It would all mix up, right? And it gets to an equilibrium configuration. So I would have a little A, B, and C up here, and I would have a little A, B, and C down in this bottom phase. And then coming out of the system, I would have compositions. Now in this case here, this notation, I put X meaning liquid, I meaning there's lots of different species of mole fractions. But since this is two liquid phases, it's a liquid-liquid extractor, I have to use an additional notation here, this capital I as phase one, or Roman numeral rather, and this Roman numeral here for phase two. So X of A phase one, for example, equals the mole fraction of A in phase one. That's what that notation means. Which one I call phase one and which one I call phase two, it doesn't matter. So typically, the goal of the liquid-liquid extractor is to pull B, which is soluble in both A and C, to one of those two phases. So obviously, if we design this well, the solute B would want to go into C more preferentially, right? Is ethanol more likely to dissolve in benzene than it is water? I don't 100% know off the top of my head, but in this example, let's say it is. So in this case here, the top phase, if this is we're sticking with this organic water mixture, this here would be the C-rich phase, potentially the benzene-rich phase. And if this is water here, this would be the A-rich phase. And in this case, we could call the A-rich phase phase two and the C-rich phase phase one. It'll all make a lot more sense when we look at the triangle diagram, I promise. Right now, it might be a little bit deep in the nomenclature. So we have two strategies to solving this uh, problem here. Okay. One, we can use the triangle diagram, which I'm sort of teasing everyone with. The other one is we can use something called a, uh, a, a partition ratio or partition coefficient. Kill my psychometric chart. So the key thing to remember here, though, is that we're doing all of this hassle just because we cannot predict the property of Ralph's. Right? Because if we could predict what's going on in the system like we could with Routes Law, I would be teaching you how to predict it. But it's non-trivial. So we have two approaches to solving this liquid-liquid-liquid liquid, liquid equilibrium or extractor problem. One is a triangle diagram. Yeah? And two is a partition coefficient. The partition coefficient, K, in this case it's B for its component B, because typically the convention 
is B is this compound that's switching between the two liquid phases. This partition coefficient in our nomenclature would be the mole fraction of species B in phase one divided by the mole fraction of species B in phase two. Now we could write this out <clears throat> Right, as the mass of species B divided by the total, sorry, the mass of species B in phase one divided by the total mass of phase one divided by mass of species B in phase two divided by the total mass of phase two. Right, so what this does is let's say, for example, if KB is greater than one, that tells us that it would rather be in phase one versus phase two. Right? And then we can sort of extract that species B from one mixture to another. This would mean that B wants to be in phase one. If KB is less than one, that means B wants to be in phase two. <coughs> But you can kind of view this as just another design specification. Right? It's a design spec that has a particular structure and format because this is the way that people have decided is the easiest to organize the results. Okay, any questions on that part so far before we dig into how we solve it with the triangle diagram? Okay. <clears throat> So the other option is we can use a triangle diagram. Now I want to draw a parallel between the triangle diagram and what we've seen already in let's say a uh, TXY diagram. So in a TXY diagram, we have T, the pressure is a constant value. We have component A on the x-axis, this is the more volatile component. Since it's the more volatile component, it wants to boil at a lower temperature, and so this is why our TXY diagram has this shape, as you shall be finding out on your homework. <laughs> at high temperature, we know it's a vapor. At low temperature, we know it's a liquid. If I want to know, if I'm at some point in my two-phase region, I want to know what is the composition of my liquid phase and what is the composition of my vapor phase. To accomplish that, I basically draw a series of lines. One is a vertical line corresponding to my system composition. The next is a horizontal line corresponding to my system temperature. Now, if I fix my feed composition, my temperature, and my pressure, I have all the information I need to solve this system, right? This right here, this gives me my liquid composition and the point where it intersects the dew curve, this gives me my vapor composition. This line is called a tie line. And in the case of a TXY and a PXY diagram, it is nice and straight and horizontal. We have the dew curve and we have the bubble curve. The dew curve and the bubble curve define the two phase boundary. Outside of it, you're a single phase, either pure vapor or pure liquid. Inside of it, you have two phases, some vapor, some liquid. Everyone's clear on this. Triangle diagram is exactly the same thing. But instead, we have three components. So we get to draw out a triangle. My best hope at an equilateral. We have A, we have B, and we have C. On it, you'll also notice, we have a curved line. This is our phase boundary. In the TXY diagram, under the phase boundary, or in between these two lines, we have 
Two faces. Exactly the same thing here. Two faces, one face. One phase, meaning everything is miscible. You have one liquid phase. And here, we have two liquid phases. Yeah. <clears throat> In the TXY diagram, our tie line corresponding to a constant temperature is horizontal because we've drawn our y-axis as temperature and we've held our pressure constant. In a triangle diagram, both the temperature and pressure are already constant. So our tie lines look a little funky. Exact same concept applies there. What do you call those lines? These are called tie lines. T I E lines. Exact same concept applies in a TXY versus a triangle diagram. I find myself in the two phase region. I draw a horizontal tie line, and it tells me the composition of my vapor, my liquid, and my vapor. Same thing happens here. I find myself in the two-phase region, and I get the composition of phase one and the composition of phase two. But since it's both liquid phases, we can't say liquid and vapor. That's why we have to use phase one and phase two. Now, the final challenge of the triangle diagram, how do we actually read the compositions? So conceptually, does anyone have any questions conceptually about how the tie lines relate here versus here. Yeah. So everything outside of the curve on the triangle diagram is just one phase. Yep. Everything underneath is two phases. Correct. Yes. <clears throat> so, for example, the, the number two on this, mm -hmm. it's not on a tie line. Right. So how does that work? So you would, you would, you would find a parallel sort of line near it. Right, so in the case here, I have point I, uh, and then the third one is on a tie line. So let's say this is I, 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 and here this is, let's say, I, I. So in the, tri in the TXY, you can draw whatever horizontal line you want, because it's your diagram, you derived it, you calculated it. In the triangle diagram, someone else generated this for you. <coughs> they went to the lab, measured real data, plotted it up, and drew this triangle diagram. They're not going to know where you fall on here. So they're going to give you enough lines so that you can kind of interpolate. So the idea would be, you can kind of see how it's fanning out a little bit here. You would kind of try and reproduce the, the fans, right? It's not parallel to the top line or the bottom line. It's sort of following that same general shape and curve. Like imagine you're trying to artistically flare it up and keep the same pattern. That's what you would do for the tie lines. Now, reading a tri triangle diagram is imagining a tug of war, okay? If I am at the point of the triangle, that is B, you'll look on your chart and you'll see the numbers count from 10 all the way up to 90 in these little sort of lines like this here. You have like 90, 80, 70, and so on and so forth. Every point in the triangle corresponds to 100% pure material. So top point here is B, is pure B, pure A, pure C. If I'm along this line here, I'm only in a mixture of B and A. If I'm on this line here, I'm only a mixture of B and C. So in this triangle diagram, which mixtures are 100% miscible of two components and which ones are not 100% miscible. Which two compounds will always dissolve into one another on this chart? A and B and B and C. That would be the example here where ethanol dissolves in water and ethanol dissolves in benzene. But A and C do not dissolve into one another. A little bit can, right? So if I'm here at pure A and I start adding a little C, I'm going to march towards this way until I encounter the two-phase region. This is the solubility of, let me write this out here, 
This is the solubility of C in A. So if we look at our triangle chart, what is the solubility of component C into component A? 95. Other way around. About 5%. So you could dissolve about 5 mole percent of C into A. And let's do the reverse. How much A into C can you dissolve according to our triangle chart? Seven, eight, yeah, 7, 8 percent, something like that. Yeah? Is this mole percent or mass percent? Typically these are mass percents. But it should say, uh, and it should be clear, but typically these triangle diagrams are actually mass percents. Why? Because it's easier. Right? If I'm in the lab, I'm going to put some grams of this, some grams of this, and some grams of that. I'm going to shake it up, let the two phases separate, measure the composition of the two phases, measure the mass of the two phases, put a plot on my diagram here. Right? That's, how we do these. That's how these charts will be generated. So converting it to molar percents would be an extra step that an experimentalist wouldn't necessarily want to do. Yeah? Sorry, um, where did you get the 70% from? I'm not asking. Uh, seven, oh, uh, seven percent. That would be about oh, here. That was this one here. About seven percent A and C. Okay, so <clears throat> when we're in the center of the chart, it's a little bit more complicated to figure out what the composition is, but really it's just a tug of war, but in this case it's with three ropes instead of two. So you'll notice you have dot I. Take a second and suss out what you think the concentration or the composition of the system is at point I. <clears throat> Noting that the closer you are to B, C, or A tells you that's what's dominating the system. So in case of point I, it's really far away from A, so we would expect it to be a low concentration. So take a second, look at it on your own, and try and figure out what is the composition at point I. Is it it has to have three, yes, because it's not on one of the edges. So if it's in the middle, you know it has a little bit of A, a little bit of B, and a little bit of C in there. Right, who's got it? That's 60, 30, 10. 60% oh. what? Sorry, sorry, it's 10% of A. So 10% of A. It's 60% B. 60% B. And 30% C. So the key thing, right, is that that point, and I've drawn this chart here so that the letters, sorry, the numbers face the right direction to read it from each of the components, kind of, right? So if you look at it here, A lines up here with the 10, C whoop, lines up there with the 30, and B lines up with the 60. Right, so that's how you read a triangle diagram. So now let's go to the more tricky ones. Let's look at number uh, point IIII. So first, Let's go through quickly, what is the concentration, what is the composition of the total mixture at point I, I, I? So in this case here, I'm actually going to write Z, A, Z, B, and Z, C. Because right? this one splits into two phases. What is the total composition? Now this one gets a little bit trickier because it's not on one of these nice clean axis points. So the easy one to read, right, is the 50% A, because that one actually falls nicely on a line. But what about B and C? What do we got going on with B and C? B's at like 12%. Yeah, I would say B is about 12%. I agree with that. So what should C have to be? We don't even have to look anymore. What does C have to be if I say these are the two compositions? It has to be 38. So let's double check. Do, do we think that C looks about like 38? So let's rotate our triangle diagram. Let's see, we have the 90s. So 40, yeah, yeah let's see, it's pretty <coughs> Right? So we've got our total composition for point I, I, I. Now, let's look at phase one. And I'm going to call phase one the C-rich phase. 
and phase two, which I'm going to call the A-rich phase. Right? Because we're in the two-phase region here. Because we know that because we've got the tie lines. We wouldn't have tie lines if we weren't in the two-phase region, right? Same thing as in the TXY diagram. There's no point to draw lines up here or down there because we know it's all liquid or all vapor. So we are going to have, we have a total composition, and we have x of A phase 1, x of B phase 2, x of C phase, oops, sorry, phase 1, phase 1, phase 1. And the same thing over here, but in this case, it's phase 2. Okay, how do we tell what our composition of our two phases are? We use the tie lines. So, I have a tie line that goes effectively uh, here and here. Uh, I don't know if this is the right, so I'm going to erase it real quick. So, this intersection here is the equivalent to this intersection here. This point here is the equivalent to this point here. Right? So, where the tie lines run into my phase boundary, that tells me what the composition of my two phases are. So, is this the A rich phase or the C rich phase? How do we know it's the C rich? Closer to C. Closer to C. A rich because it's closer to A, which means it's mostly A, and this one's mostly C. So what is the composition of our C rich phase at a total mixture composition of I, I, I? So I'm hearing like about 68% C. That looks about right to me. What else? Yeah, that's what I was looking at about two. Okay, now let's just do the math. What does this have to be if this is the right amount? It would have to be 20. Yeah, it's not 100% right. Right, it looks to me like this is about 0. Point maybe 0.29. So maybe one of these two numbers are a little bit off. Maybe let's say this is uh, let's say this is maybe closer to sixty-seven, right? Sir, I'm confused on how you're making the. Be oh, sorry, it's, it's, it should be twenty-one. Yeah, yeah twenty-one. There it is. And this should add up to hundred or one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Never mind. You called. Yeah, no, I I, 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 wrote, I read it wrong. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I don't have the answer to these questions. I just made this up and I. Figured I'd figure it out as we went. Okay, uh, so that's the C-rich phase. Now what about the A-rich phase? Right, so we're repeating the same process. So what's, uh, what is the composition of A in the A-rich phase? 92. Yeah, 92, 93, something like that. I'm, I'm kind of inclined maybe to push it more towards 93, but I might be wrong. Okay, what about B? Yeah, that seems about right, yeah. 4%. And then C should have to be what? 4%. According to this, it would have to be 3% if it adds up to 1. So how are you reading the B? The B, same thing. So in this case here, the B right, is all the way down at the far end. So basically, how close is this line to this bottom axis here? Or how far is it away from this point up there? Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if for the, for the uh, B, we're below the 10 line, really down far. Now, before everyone heads out, let's just go over one quick consistency check. So in this scenario, which Solvent does B want to be in? A or C? C, because it is much higher concentration of B in C than B in A. So this would be an effective liquid-liquid extraction process. 
Now, why liquid-liquid extraction is used is because of how bad a distillation is. Now, distillation is really good at separating things, but it is also really good at spending a lot of money, right? Distillation is extremely energy intensive because you have to not only boil, you have to basically be boiling and condensing the same mixture at the same time, right? So you're throwing energy into it to heat it up and you're also throwing energy into it to cool it down, right? And that's just how distillation operates. So distillation is a very energy intensive process. The reason why ethanol is not necessarily the best future fuel for our society is because we have to distill the water out of ethanol in order to use it as a substitute for gasoline or something like that, right? So if you can find a way to extract ethanol cheaply and efficiently from a sort of fermented biofeedstock, then you can generate a lot of money, right? But right now they're just, they're just distilling it. But the energy that goes into distilling the ethanol basically takes away most all of the benefits you get from, you know, greenhouse gases, carbon neutrality, and all that kind of stuff, right? So liquid liquid extraction doesn't cost you any money. It's just thermodynamics. But it's much harder to design because you're not just throwing a flame under a pot of water and boiling it. Right, you have to very specifically choose the right thermodynamic mixture. Okay, so with this information, hopefully you can finish the rest of homework five. Uh, office hours today, office hours tomorrow. Come uh, with questions if you have any struggles. Thank you.